communications coordinator for the New Hampshire Food Alliance. Um, we are a statewide network that su uh, supports and connects people in growing a sustainable and fair and thriving local food system here in New Hampshire. Um, you are here at our one of our network cafes. This is our first network cafe of 2023 and our third in our 2022-2023 series. Um, so really excited to have this, this here today on this Friday. Um, a couple more things before we really get into what we are going to discuss today. Um, the New Hampshire Food Alliance is a part of the Sustainability Institute at UNH. Um, we're very proud of that. And with all of that comes um, some, some interesting um, collaborations and things that we work on together um, with students, with, with our community. And part of, of our mission is bringing all the great things that happen at the Sustainability Institute into, into our community here in New Hampshire. So that's what this is a part of. Um, before we get started, I wanna just uh, acknowledge that the New Hampshire Food Alliance and the University of New Hampshire believes diversity, equity, accessibility, and inclusion are foundational values inextricably linked to achieving our core educational mission and embracing the many characteristics of our community members that make them uniquely themselves. And in that vein, we also wish to acknowledge the spiritual and physical connection the Penacook, Abenaki, and Wabanaki peoples have maintained to Indakana, which the University of New Hampshire community is honored to steward today. And if you are interested in um, reading the full land, uh, land, water, and life acknowledgement from UNH, that is linked in our agenda. Um, also something to take note of is our community agreement and as well as our evaluation, which I will ask you all to take at the end of our network cafe today. But um, our community agreement is important. It's, it's an outline of, of what we expect here and what you should expect from us. Um, and you're, you're welcome to make comments about that and, and talk with us about it offline if needed. Um, last thing I wanna go through before we again get into the, to the, the meat of the day as our desired outcomes for the day. So <clears throat> we're hoping to you know, develop a shared understanding of you know, current peer reviewed data that shows about the carbon footprint of our different food choices, um, identify areas of overlap and alignment between that understanding and our work to strengthen New Hampshire's food system, and then do a little brainstorming about takeaways that will help um, you know, the Food Alliance and our partners communicate clearly and accurately about climate friendly eating, because that's what we're here to talk about. Um, so generally our network cafe series, they occur on the first Friday of each month, September through April, and they serve as an informal, you know, lively conversation, um, with our partners about different food system topic topics. But this year, uh, we are kind of have a little theme going on. It's, uh, based off of how do we build a climate resilient food system in New Hampshire, six ways that sustainable food systems build climate resilience. It's a long title, but it's very important. Um, and it's a framework that we developed with our climate action team um, to kind of get our network aligned and, and working towards moving our food system um, into helping build climate resilience in, in New Hampshire. And so we've been using each month of our Network Cafe series to dig into one of those six ways that it's in that framework. So today our topic is climate-friendly eating, um, which can quickly <laughs> be summed up as understanding the carbon footprint of our food choices and how what we choose to eat has a direct impact on our climate. Um, we discovered as a team, a backbone team, that this concept is deceivingly simple and extremely complex when you really dig into it. So that's why we're really excited to bring it to you today as a network. Um, it can be complex because when we lay over our food system values over this, this science and the data of, of carbon footprint of, of food and, and agricultural production, things get a little sticky. So we're gonna we're gonna we're gonna dive into that with um, Dr. Ali Leach, who is one of our colleagues at SI. Um, and she's gonna help us, you know, use data to gain a better understanding of the carbon footprint and how they're related to our food choices. And then, you know, with that knowledge in hand, we're going to be joined by Nancy LaRoe, Vital Communities. She's going to help us, just, you know, answer questions, discuss, talk, and, you know, hopefully develop some clear understandings and, and maybe messaging that we can use to talk about this relationship between carbon footprint and food choices and how we can, you know, embrace that in supporting our local food system and reducing our impact on the climate. 
Um, I'm really excited about this because I think this is one of our best or one of the only network cafes in this series that we can make an impact as soon as we log off here. Like we all make food choices every single day. I'm going to eat lunch right after this. And I have a choice of what I want to eat and where it comes from and how it's made and how it's grown. And we all have that choice. So that's, a, I think, a really empowering way to view this topic that can, again, be a little complex. So I'm going to introduce Allie really quick to everyone. And I, in her bio's a little bit long, but I think it's so, so important. And I'm going to read it from the, a little bit from the UNH website. And I urge you to go read more because I think she um, is, we're so excited and valued to have her as a part of the SI team. But Dr. Allison Leach is the SIMAP program manager with UNH Sustainability Institute. She is the developer of the nitrogen footprint approach, and she is a co-developer of SIMAP, the campus carbon and nitrogen footprint tool hosted by the UNH Sustainability Institute. Um, Ali leads the research, new development, intern recruitment and support outreach and user support for SIMAP, which is a lot. <laughs> she is a, also the co-instructor for the newly launched Carbon Clinic and the PD&T Carbon Footprinting Certificate. And her dissertation from her studies uh, was titled The Nitrogen Challenge, Footprint Tools and On-Farm Solutions. So I like to think she is a great, great, great guest to have. And I'm happy to introduce her and let her take the mic for her presentation. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, thank you so much, Colleen, for that great introduction and also for the context um, that you provided to uh, start us off with this discussion today. Um, so I'm going to share my screen here. Let's see, actually, could you enable screen sharing, Colleen? There we go. Okay, great. So um, I am so excited to be here with you all today to talk about food and the environment and sustainability. Um, I think this is this is one of my favorite topics to talk about, and I'm so excited for the discussion. And um, I think it's a, a really important one, as Colleen said. Um, it's one where we can all log off today and make a change. You know, we can all have an impact on with our everyday food choices on the environment and on climate. So we're really going to be covering um, three topics today, the environmental impacts of food production, looking at how food production releases greenhouse gas emissions, and then looking at a few other environmental impacts as well, because um, it's not just a greenhouse gas emissions that we see from food production. There are a few other environmental impacts as well that are, are related, all part of the same system. And we're going to use environmental footprints as a way to compare across food types and then focus in on what we can do, what we can all do as individuals to reduce our personal impact um, with our food choices. And wanted to share a little bit more about um, the perspective that I come to this work with. Um, most of my work has been from the footprinting side. So as Colleen said, I'm the program manager now for a tool called SIMAP that we host here at UNH. It's a tool for organizations to calculate their carbon and nitrogen footprints used by higher ed and a number of nonprofits and municipalities and small businesses. And so part of that calculation is food. So we have um, calculations for the carbon emissions and nitrogen emissions from food purchases at uh, an organization that uses SIMAP, and a lot of my work has been with that kind of top-down footprinting perspective, um, looking at the national or international perspective from it with a modeling approach. Um, I've also come to this work from another perspective as well, from my master's work and my um, PhD work. I worked on a couple of farms, um, looking at the nitrogen budget and nitrogen cycling within those farms. One of those was a um, permaculture livestock farm in Virginia, and then also um, had the opportunity to work at UNH's organic dairy research farm as part of my PhD work. So I both um, did an overall nitrogen budget for that farm and also did research at our heat recovery compost facility, looking at um, some of the flows there and the emissions that were released at um, that, that innovative facility. And so I'm coming at this work with kind of these two different perspectives, but most of my work has been at this, um, this footprinting scale. Okay, so with that, let's let's dive in. So uh, I really like to start at the the very beginning for this topic, and I think this is a, a piece that um, that this group is going to be very familiar with, but still I think it's important to state. And that's the 
incredible value that we get from food, that food is central to life, that we all, we all need it, um, of course, to survive for life. Um, also for our health, our, our dietary choices have in, tremendous impacts on our health and can improve our health. And that it's not just that, it's not just um, food for survival and health, that we also get these other incredible benefits from food, that it's central to our culture and to our quality of life. Uh, food brings people together. I mean, we just um, came out of the holidays here and that food is often a very central part of many of our holiday gatherings. And so there's these tremendous benefits um, that we of course get from food that cannot be um, overstated. And here we've got a figure here showing that there are, are many, uh, many mouths to feed in our world. So we have, as you all know, a growing global population. And with a growing global population, that means more food that needs to be produced and more food that has been produced. And so we've seen um, tremendous increases in food production rates over the past decades, over the past century. Um, which has been the result of um, a lot of innovation and scientific advances. And at the same time, we've also seen increasing demand for meat production, meat products in particular. On um, this graph that I have here is showing in the top panel um, the global consumption rate for meat increasing from 1960 through 2010. And the lower panel is showing um, those same figures, but by region. And what um, this graph is really showing, this one on the bottom, is that as countries uh, develop and begin to accumulate wealth, uh, that they begin to also um, uh, consume more meat, meat products, luxury products. In particular, we see that there's increase um, in China and also in, in Asia. That's where we're seeing um, this large increasing demand for meat consumption. And as you all see, when we get into um, some of the, the details comparing across food products, that meat production is often more resource intensive and has more environmental impact. So not only is there this demand for more food, but this more resource intensive food. So how do we, how do we meet that demand? Um, so modern agriculture has brought us tremendous benefits um, that we're producing more food than ever before. Things that were previously um, limiting for agriculture like nitrogen, um, nitrogen fertilizer, we now have solutions to that. We can produce synthetic fertilizer, industrial fertilizer, so it's no longer a limiting nutrient for food production, of course, with some consequences with overuse, but that it's no longer a limiting nutrient for our food production. That we have a lot of new agricultural technologies that are more resource efficient. And that one benefit of intensification is that it saves land, where we can produce more food on the same area of land but that there are lots of trade-offs and drawbacks to modern agriculture. We had this challenge of producing more food, more fiber, and these competing interests like producing biofuel and need to produce those additional um, products while also um, making sure we're keeping all of these other aspects in mind, alleviating rural poverty, improving diets and health, increasing environmental, or at least maintaining environmental resources at a minimum for future generations, and doing all of that while trying to combat climate change. And so this is a lot, this is a, this is a big challenge and our food system is central to a lot of this. And so I wanted to take a look at a brief tour of how food production impacts our environment. Um, so as I started this off, that food is central to our lives and it makes sense that it, um, that so much of our, our land and so much of our, our resources go towards food production, but this has impacts as well. This has consequences for our environment. And here I have a list of five environmental impacts and we'll focus on the first greenhouse gas emissions, but also wanted to take a quick look at four others that are all related because it's all part of the same system. And you'll see that um, there's, there's really co-benefits for a lot of the solutions for reducing these environmental impacts um, that we don't see too many trade-offs or pollution swapping across these. So the first of these is greenhouse gas emissions, then nutrient pollution, so nitrogen and phosphorus pollution, um, biodiversity loss, um, fresh water consumption, and land use. So I'm gonna start off here with greenhouse gas emissions and the sources of greenhouse gases from food production. Um, so these are the, the major sources and there are others. Um, so starting at the beginning here, we've got enteric fermentation and that is the, the scientific term, the fancy term for cow burps. So um, just because of the biology of cows and the foods that they eat, they um, burp methane, 
And that's a uh, an issue for two reasons. One is that methane is a greenhouse gas, and so it has a warming effect. Um, but it's not only a greenhouse gas, it's also a very potent greenhouse gas. So on a 20-year time scale, the warming effect of methane is actually over 80 times greater than the warming effect of CO2. So every amount of um, methane that we're releasing has a larger impact than, um, than CO2 and, and can be very impactful from a warming perspective. Another important one to keep in mind is manure management. Um, and there's lots of different ways um, for uh, manure management systems to reduce emissions, but that there are usually going to be some emissions from manure management, that there is some um, volatilization or release of two greenhouse, two major greenhouse gases, nitrous oxide and methane. Um, so again, methane is a potent greenhouse gas and nitrous oxide is actually even more potent. Um, so impacts almost 300 times greater than CO2. Less nitrous oxide is usually released um, than methane, but that it is a potent greenhouse gas, so any amount is going to be impactful. And we also have some general um, soil respiration effects from microbial activity in our soils. And a really important one is on a global scale. It's maybe one that we don't see quite as much in the US, but in areas like the Amazon, where it can be um, very significant, is um, deforestation. And this is a, a big issue um, when land is cleared, um, especially forested land for food production. And that's because it really has a, a two effects. One is that you're clearing out um, land that previously was a carbon sink. So by clearing out land for food production and cutting down trees, clear cutting, um, you're removing what was a carbon sink. And in some parts of the world, like in the Amazon, that's an area that uh, is a particularly large carbon sink and um, has climate regulating effects. So the more of that we clear out, um, the, the less of a climate regulating effect we're going to see from the Amazon. So we're removing a carbon sink and then turning that land into something that will become a carbon source, especially if it's used for something like meat production. And a uh, last one that I want to mention here that is also very significant is food waste. And I'm um, sure a topic that you all are, are very familiar with that um, globally and in the US, we waste over 30% of our food. And um, uh, an important way to think about that is it's not just the food itself that we're wasting, it's all of the emissions that happened before that food um, was produced. So we're not just throwing away the food itself and seeing the emissions from that food decomposing in our landfills. Um, we're also essentially wasting those emissions upstream are still happening, right? So all of those emissions across the supply chain are still happening. And then that food isn't even um, being consumed. And so that's a, a really big opportunity, really, where, um, well, we'll talk about this later on, but where we don't even need to change our diets, if we better manage our food waste, that we can have a really big impact on um, reducing uh, environmental effects from food. And if you're interested in reading more about this, there was a great um, IPCC special report that came out a few years ago called Climate Change and Land that went a lot into uh, some of these topics. So then um, what you're probably wondering is what do these emissions look like compared to global greenhouse gas emissions? So how big a contribution does food have to global greenhouse gas emissions? And then how does that break out across the supply chain and across food types? So this is from a, a paper in Nature Food on um, et al. from last year, 2021, where they were looking at global emissions, global greenhouse gas emissions in 2015, and found that food was about a third of that. And this aligns really well with um, what I found in other sources from the IPCC and other resources. Um, so this is a pretty good representation of an estimate of global emissions, where food is making up about one third of global greenhouse gas emissions. So that's significant. Um, that's a that's a large proportion. And if we then break that out across the supply chain, um, we see that the, the first major source is land use. So that's um, where things like de deforestation come into play, um, land use change. Agricultural production is, as you might expect, um, the biggest. So that's those on-farm emissions. Those are the emissions that are occurring while the food is being produced. Then everything else is across the supply chain. So um, the biggest piece here is food waste, but that there's small emissions along the way for the supply chain. Um, but what this, um, I think this graph really underscores is that most of these emissions are occurring on the farm and that land use is an important piece as well to keep in mind for this. 
And there's another paper that came out um, a couple years ago now that was looking at um, what we need to do to meet the goals set in Paris, um, the, the um, greenhouse gas production goals, trying to keep warming to 1.5 degrees Celsius. And what they were doing is looking at uh, what if any changes would be necessary to our food system to achieve that target. And so they did this big um, global modeling analysis where they looked at a number of different scenarios and said, you know, what if we're able to just um, cut out energy emissions almost entirely? Like what would we would we be able to achieve that target? And really they found that the answer was no, that food is that we will need to make changes to our food system uh, to keep warming to 1.5 degrees Celsius. And so I think this just really underscores um, how central our, our food system is to um, achieving our climate goals, that really we will need to make changes. Um, and there's, there's no one single change, as we'll see later on, that there'll need to be changes across our supply chain and to our dietary choices to really achieve the global targets that we're trying to achieve to avoid more climate impacts. And there is work being done on this at the international scale through um, conventions. Food is getting more attention now. And this is relatively recent. Um, food and agriculture uh, weren't really being discussed in some of the early COP meetings. And the COP meetings are the um, annual international meetings where nations come together to discuss um, climate change negotiations. And Paris was one of these COP meetings. And um, the most two, uh, two years ago, in 2021, there was a meeting in Glasgow where they many countries signed on and agreed for the first time to target methane em emissions in particular. And this is significant for agriculture um, because agriculture is one of the major sources of methane emissions from things uh, like cow burps, enteric fermentation, and manure management. So agriculture, in addition to waste, are really some of the major sources of methane emissions. And so to achieve these 30% reduction targets, agriculture will need to be part of that story. And um, there hasn't been too much progress made on these yet. I believe it's at the stage where countries are uh, putting together their plans for how they would achieve it, but it was still a really big deal that countries came together and said, we're going to do something about methane um, because producing methane emissions can have uh, such a big impact because it's such a potent greenhouse gas. And then at the most recent COP meeting in Egypt, um, this, this past fall, um, food was on the agenda. And so this was big. Food hadn't really been on the agenda before. And so food and agriculture um, were part of the discussion. And again, it's one where there weren't any, um, any agreements necessarily made at this most recent meeting, but that it was part of the discussion and part of the agenda. So that, that was essential. So work is happening at the international scale now um, on this topic. And wanted to briefly just look at a couple of other environmental impacts here before we get into our footprint comparison. And one of those is nutrient pollution. And this is where a lot of uh, my background is from around nitrogen footprints and nutrient pollution. And when I talk about nutrient pollution, I'm talking about uh, nitrogen and phosphorus and other nutrients. And this is a challenging one because we need nutrients to grow our crops. So I'm sure this is something that you all are very familiar with, that we need to apply fertilizer, um, either it, as a synthetic fertilizer or organic fertilizer, like, like compost and like manure. Um, but that those same nutrients, most of those nutrients don't actually end up in the crops that we're trying to grow. Um, and those same nutrients, when they get in the environment, they then accumulate in the environment where they can contribute to a cascade of negative environmental impacts. Um, what we've got here is a picture in the background of an algal bloom. And so nutrient pollution is the main, is the driver of um, algal blooms in bodies of water um, and in eutrophication in bodies of water. And there's a number of other environmental impacts that we see from um, excess nutrients that accumulate in the environment, like water acidification and for nitrogen, we see other impacts like air quality impacts um, and even stratospheric ozone depletion. And what's um, particularly unique about nitrogen is that with um, the invention of um, industrial synthetic fertilizer, we remove nitrogen as a limiting ingredient for food production. So it used to be that we had these limited natural reserves, but over a hundred years ago, scientists figured out how to manufacture um, uh, ammonia so we could make fertilizer um, and apply it to our crop fields. And so removed it as a limiting um, ingredient or a limiting nutrient, uh, but it also has meant that we now have applied a lot of nitrogen to our, our fields and that humans are now actually 
creating two to four times as much, um, it's called reactive nitrogen, than nature. So we're, uh, we've contributed to this huge alteration of the global nitrogen cycle. And a lot of that nitrogen is then accumulating in the environment where it's causing environmental impacts. One other topic I wanted to chat about briefly here was um, biodiversity loss. And this is another interesting one because um, agriculture can cause biodiversity loss for certain types of agriculture, um, but that we also need biodiversity in our agricultural systems for a resilient agricultural system. Um, so the impacts that we see from in terms of biodiversity loss are usually from um, big conventional or, or monoculture farms. So it's things like habitat loss where we're clearing land um, for food production, and we have habitat loss for um, species, overexploitation for fishery systems where we're depleting um, our fishing stocks. And pesticide use is a, a really big one because pesticide use um, causes impacts to pollinators, and we need pollinators for our food system. We rely on them. And so by using pesticides, um, we then hurt the pollinators that we, we rely on for diverse food production. And so we need agricultural biodiversity for a number of reasons. Um, and one is just ensuring that we can produce food, fiber, and fuel, that um, our flower and crops rely on those pollinators. And it also a lot gives us resilience to changing conditions. Um, so for example, with climate change, as, as, um, as regions warm, um, for example, pests and diseases that weren't previously in certain regions, um, we'll now be able to extend to um, extend further to new regions. And if we have monoculture systems, if we don't have a lot of biodiversity, we're going to be much more susceptible to those types of impacts and threats. And so biodiversity gives us more resilience to a changing system as we start to see new potential threats. Water scarcity is one that I know we don't think about very much um, in New England since we usually are not, I know we had a drought just this past summer, but usually do not have very many water limitations in the region, um, but that many parts of the world do experience um, water scarcity. And I noticed that this map is a little out of date here. I imagine that if we had a more recent map, we would see more of the Western US um, would be considered to be in a level of water scarcity uh, with the droughts that we've seen over the last decade in that region. And agriculture is our really largest by far consumer of um, fresh water use, which is really um, a limited resource in many ways. And so this graph on the right is showing a breakdown of how of fresh water use um, across all uses, where you can see arable land is the largest, and that's cropland, um, both for crops for human consumption and also feed crops. Um, livestock, and then the remaining sectors are municipal and industrial. So really most of our freshwater consumption is going to agriculture. And our very last um, environmental impact topic here before we get into our footprint comparisons is mm -hmm. land use. Um, and land, here we have a figure showing land use across the globe again, and that agriculture occupies about 40% of our global land. So a, a really large proportion of our land that's dedicated to food production in some way. So how do we make sense of all that information? How do we uh, boil that down to something that can help us um, make climate-friendly dietary decisions? Uh, so we can use footprints to compare across food types. And what are footprints? So footprints um, describe the pressure on the environment from resource consumption. And there's a number of different footprints. And we'll be looking at a few of these today in our comparisons. One of those is the water footprint, which is freshwater consumption. Um, the carbon footprint is kind of shorthand for greenhouse gas emissions during food production. So when I refer to the carbon footprint, I'm not just talking about carbon dioxide. It also includes methane and nitrous oxide and other greenhouse gases. Um, nitrogen footprint, which is nitrogen pollution during food production and the land footprint, which is the land area used for food production. So this graph is then showing the water, carbon, and nitrogen footprint for major food categories and all um, on, on the same axis here and normalized. So water, one droplet of water shows a liter of water. Um, one CO2 cloud shows a kilogram of carbon dioxide equivalents, which includes normalized greenhouse gases um, like methane and nitrous oxide. And one bag of fertilizer shows a gram of nitrogen. And these are all per one kilogram of food. And so looking across these, um, the first thing you can see is that there's some pretty consistent trends 
And this holds true for other footprints as well. If we were to look at the land footprint, the phosphorus footprint, um, where on average, if a food has a large carbon footprint, it's also going to have a large water footprint and a large nitrogen footprint and vice versa, which is good news really for dietary choices. So there aren't too many trade-offs. Um, if we're going to make a dietary choice for a climate-friendly diet, it's also probably going to have good impacts for your nitrogen footprint, for your water footprint, for other environmental impacts as well. The other thing that I think comes through in this is that the animal-based products have larger footprints than the plant-based products. And this really just comes down to um, the, the supply chain and, and what goes into producing our animal products. So when we're producing meat or an animal product, um, we need to grow a crop and then the animal. So there's more steps on the supply chain, more resources that are needed, and more steps across the supply chain where losses can occur, where emissions can occur, where resources are needed. So it's really just um, an inherent difference in, the, in these production systems. And it is, of course, possible to, to move the needle a little bit for these, right? So that these um, figures that I'm showing here are averages for the U.S., so averages across the entire U.S., and it is possible, of course, with um, sustainable and regenerative practices to make reductions to any of these. Um, but the differences across food products, across food types, just due to the, um, the biology of the animals um, and of the crops themselves, the differences across food types are almost always going to be larger than the differences within a food category from changing products. So we can reduce this beef number, but that the beef footprint is almost always going to be larger than a pork footprint and a poultry footprint. Allie, I'm going to just hop in for one second to raise, I don't, I want to save the questions for the end, but I just want to raise two specific questions about this graph. If, if you're okay, um, and they're the last two questions in the chat, they're specific to clarifications for this graph. So one is, do the values for fish, do you know if the, the seafood includes both wild caught and farmed? Um, and the second, I'll just read the second one and then you can answer both. And then beef, does beef mean those raised using CAFOs or only beef using, uh, or does beef also include cattle raised using regenerative practices? Yep, great question. So for the seafood one, um, this is uh, wild caught and farmed fish. So it's an average for the U.S. And it's about an even split for consumption in the U.S. where about half is um, wild caught and half is farmed fish. And most of the impacts that we see um, from a, a resource perspective, from an emissions perspective, are from farmed fish. Um, because wild caught fish, um, there's not a, a feed component. We're not, we're not growing feed as well. The emissions really just occur um, after the fish is caught. So most of the emissions that you're seeing here and the impacts that you're seeing here from fish are from farmed fish. Um, although it is an average. So if it were just farmed fish, it would actually be a little bit larger. And um, the beef footprint is an average for the US. And so that means it's mostly going to be conventional production since most of the production in the US is, um, is going to be conventional production. And so it would include um, organic farms and regenerative practices in the US, but it's really just a weighted average across the entire US. And I don't have these slides as part of the presentation, but I have a couple of comparative graphs that we could look at later on across some um, of these different, the differences within categories from different um, farming practices. Okay, great questions. Um, so now uh, what we're going to turn to is climate-friendly diets. So what do we do with this information from footprints and how can we apply some of these um, what sort of dietary choices can we apply to our everyday life to reduce our personal impact and have a more sustainable diet? So first I wanted to look at a couple of diet scenarios. And so these diet scenarios um, come from a report from the World Resources Institute called Shifting Diets for a Sustainable Food Future. And what they did was they looked at four different diets and looked at the land footprint and the carbon footprint associated with those diets. And for the diets that they identified, um, they ensured that they were all like, nutritionally adequate so that the calorie levels were about the same across all four diets and that um, all nutritional needs and health needs were being met from those diets. So they were all healthy diets. Um, and then they calculated the land footprint and 
the um, greenhouse gas footprint for those diets. The four diets are a US reference diet, so the current US average diet, um, a US traditional Mediterranean diet, so a diet that has um, less meat, more plants, and some switches within the meat category, so more of an emphasis on seafood, for example. Um, the ambitious beef reduction diet um, reduces beef, still has meat as part of the diet, um, and increases plants, and then there's a, um, a vegetarian diet. And you can see the colors um, at the bottom here that are used in the graph. So in this first one, we're looking at land use in acres um, across uh, for the US diet and each little square here shows acres. Um, and so you can see that a small part of it is from plants and that the majority is really from um, beef in red, dairy in orange and some other animal based foods. And so as you might, um, might have expected that the land requirement um, kind of decreases across these, that we see a pretty big land area reduction just from the Mediterranean footprint from some dietary switches, um, an even larger reduction from the US ambitious beef reduction diet and the footprint or the land footprint is really cut in half for the vegetarian diet. So that's a huge reduction, you know, cutting in half the amount of land required um, for for an individual's diet. And the second one here is greenhouse gas emissions in tons of carbon dioxide equivalents. And so the US average diet is at 1.4 metric tons of carbon dioxide equivalents. And the story is the same across um, the other three diets here, where we see reductions across every single one. And these reductions, even if everyone were to switch, for example, to the traditional Mediterranean diet, these reductions across the board would be significant, right? That really would add up um, across, um, across an entire population. And so I think this really underscores the impact of our dietary choices, how much of an impact they can have on um, land use and greenhouse gas emissions. Food waste, we talked about a little bit earlier, uh, but the, as you all know, um, we waste a lot of food globally, about a third of it. Um, and this is equivalent to 1.3 billion tons of edible food on a global basis, that this contributes to a lot of greenhouse gas emissions, a lot of um, water use and land area. And that what's really important to remember here is that we're not just throwing away the food, we're essentially throwing away all of those upstream emissions that are occurring too, that those emissions are occurring anyway, and then the food, the product is not even being consumed. So this is such a huge opportunity um, from a, a food management and diet perspective, just reducing our food waste. And very briefly here, I know we need to wrap up in just a, a couple minutes here, I wanted to um, highlight the Eat Lancet Commission report. This is a really nice report that came out a few years ago that pulled together the current science and understanding and tried to make sense of it all and make some recommendations for a global planetary health diet. And the leads on this, um, there's leads from all over the world, but one of the, the main leads most recently has been um, Johan Rockström, who's done a lot of the planetary boundaries work, looking at um, global systems and planetary health. And so what you're seeing here is the recommended diet that they came up with, but one of their major findings was that there's not a single diet. They don't, didn't want to recommend a single diet for everybody because they acknowledge that food serves um, so many benefits to our lives that it's, um, and there's so many uh, different factors that go into deciding what we eat. And so they encourage diversity in our diets. They're, two of their major recommendations are choose health, sustainability and deliciousness. So I think acknowledging that um, it's important that we like our food, right? It's important that we enjoy eating our food and prepare to increase, diversify and reduce. So reducing being an important one there, but just that they're emphasizing this um, diversifying our, our diets. And they had recommendations across uh, what to eat, um, how to produce your food and where to buy your food or how to prepare your food rather. And so these all come straight from this report and they've got a really nice brief that they prepared uh, for consumers. And they've got briefs for farmers, for policymakers, for healthcare workers. Um, these recommendations here all come straight from the brief for consumers. And I thought they were just really nice and a, a good overview of um, some, some key recommendations. And so again, encouraging diversity, dive into the breadth of options, embracing plants as a source of protein. So this was a, a key theme that we um, should increase our plant consumption for health reasons and environmental reasons and going easy on meat consumption and approaching food in moderation, 
and um, where to buy your food. So they encourage folks to support regenerative farming practices and that vote with every plate, that every time um, we're purchasing food, um, we're sending a signal. We're saying this is the kind of food we as consumers want to be eating. And so we're essentially voting for the types of food that we want to eat, that we want to have available and encouraging biodiversity. And then how to prepare your food, they um, encourage planning ahead to reduce waste, cooking more at home um, for health reasons and as a way to reduce waste. And then waste not, want not. So reducing waste anywhere we can. So to summarize, uh, we've covered a lot of ground here and wanted to um, come back to the point that food is central to our lives and brings so many values to our lives. And the agriculture also has impacts on our environment. Uh, this is a list of some of the ones that we went through here today about the ways that our food production system impacts the environment. And across these that meat and animal products tend to have the largest impacts. And that there's a lot that we can do as individuals, as consumers, and that our dietary choices really do matter and do have an impact on, um, on our environment. And some of the key recommendations that have come out of the literature, that Eat Lancet report, those diet scenarios are eating more plant-based food, um, reducing resource intensive meat and reducing food waste. So with that, I want to make sure we've got plenty of time for discussion here. I'd like to thank you all for your attention and looking forward to your questions. I see there's been lots of discussion in the chat, which is fantastic. So I was wondering, Nancy, if you had an idea of where we might start. Yeah, I mean, I've tracked a couple of questions in the chat. Um, maybe we can stop sharing, perfect, stop sharing the screens is perfect. Um, thank you, Allie. So, Nancy LaRoe, I work at Vital Communities um, in food and economy and also former pasture-based livestock farmer. So I'm excited to be facilitating the conversation because um, it's near and dear to my heart. Um, there were a couple questions in the chat. A lot of people had answers already in the chat. So one, well, I just went, I copied them, what in order. Um, how important is food source in enteric fermentation methane release, if you happen to know that? That was one of the very first ones that was way early in the conversation, so. Yeah, so um, that that does matter. Um, and there's a lot of great research happening actually right at UNH about how um, diets for cattle can reduce enteric fermentation. Um, so some researchers at UNH are looking at some diets that I believe have like seaweed and kelp was part of the mixture that would actually um, reduce, um, reduce methane production. And I, um, um, so I don't know the degree to which that reduces it. I think there's ongoing research that looks into that, but that it can absolutely have an impact. Super, and then the other one that was in the chat, Alan, if you're on, maybe this got answered. Alan, are you, can you answer, ask, did your question get answered? It's about the, describe the percentages of gas, greenhouse gas percentages. Hi, Nancy, um, um, no, I don't know that it is. Um, so I'll summarize. Um, thank you for an informative presentation. We hear 30% of agriculture, but another 60% um, is industry. You know, 41% um, are passenger cars. That totals more than 100% uh, global. And I, I tried to make sure that I was looking at the global numbers. Is there that much discrepancy in interpretation? Yeah, so another way of looking at this, and I, I went with the total graph from a single source, um, just because uh, it makes it a little bit easier to talk about, but there's usually ranges. There's a lot of uncertainty in our understanding of the global totals. And so the IPCC, for example, says that food emissions, I believe it was on the order of like 21 to 37 percent. Um, and so this report that I showed today was kind of right in the middle of that, about one third, um, but that there's uncertainty ranges for, um, for all of these, just because it can be so challenging to estimate um, greenhouse gas emissions at a global scale. These are estimates for a lot of greenhouse gas emissions. We're not actually out there you know, measuring the emissions from a particular cow, from a particular car's tailpipe. We're estimating on a, um, a global basis. And that's why there's some uncertainty for these. Um, so you're right that if you add up the numbers from different um, from different sources like that, it's not it might exceed 100%, um, and that's why I showed from one source. But 
um, that there is just generally some uncertainty in this. I think the message is still pretty clear though, that on average food is about one third um, and that the remaining portion is non-food. So industry, fossil fuel combustion primarily. Great. Um, and then I see Rachel has a hand up, but I'll just jump in with, there's a couple in the chat. How does local food tend to compare to non-local food across all of these footprints? Yes, great question. And there's not a, um, not always a clear answer. So it really depends on what's happening on the farm. Um, and it comes down to the specific farms practices. Um, so if we're just thinking about local food from a distance perspective, so say we've got a conventional farm um, that's, that's somewhere else in the Midwest and we've got a local farm here, they're using the same practices, the only difference is the miles traveled, um, the local far food is going to have a lower carbon footprint, but it's not going to be much lower. So those final transport emissions are actually a pretty small percentage of the overall um, footprint for a food product. Most of the emissions are actually happening um, on the farm, on the farm and due to, um, and some due to processing and across the supply chain. Um, so what really matters is what's happening on the farm. And that's why you know, knowing your, your farmers and um, working and buying food from a farm that you, you know and understand their practices is important. Um, so farmers that are using these regenerative practices are going that are recycling, um, that are reducing waste are going to have um, lower emissions. But it's not it's not necessarily a clear answer about um, whether local uh, local doesn't necessarily have a smaller footprint. It really depends on the farm's practices. Great. Rachel, you have your hand raised. Thanks. Um, I just wanted to circle back to Alan's question. Alan, I'm not sure if you saw my answer to it in the chat, but if I'm looking at that graph correctly that Dr. Leach posted, you asked specifically about the energy sector. And so I think if, if you read the, gra the graph or the graphic as like concentric circles, it's saying in the middleest circle that energy is 73.2% of the whole budget, but the energy is an industry is 24.2% of that 73.2%. So if you add up all of the percentages, obviously it'll be more than hundred, but as you go out, those are percentages of the things that are closer into the center, if that makes sense. Thanks, Rachel, Alan. Uh, thanks, thanks very much, Rachel. I appreciate that. And what I'm just, I'll, I will clarify very briefly. I only use that graph at the very end. When we hear discussions in general about greenhouse gas emissions globally, we hear these larger numbers like 30%, like 70, like 40 for significant categories like automobiles that all of a sudden we're at 170%. And so I'm just wasn't sure if it was discrepancy. And of, of course, I'll leave it at that. Um, Allison, uh, that your clarification was certainly helpful on ranges. Thank you. Uh, so there's a question from Edith in the chat. In calculating footprints, is the impact of transportation, processing, packaging, refrigeration, storage, the associated industrial food system included here? I think the answer is yes, but. Yes, yes. So uh, most of these analyses are going to include that full supply chain. Um, most of the emissions, again, are happening on the farm, but there are, are emissions every single step of the way. So any processing, packaging, um, distribution, storage, all of that has emissions as well. So um, these analyses, like the carbon footprint analyses, they use an approach called life cycle assessment, um, where they're looking across the supply chain and looking at the emissions at each step um, along the way. Um, and and I'm, I, also, yeah. Go ahead. I'm just going to also add briefly that the um, results I was showing, um, they're also not just from one life cycle assessment. So because so many of these studies have been done, they're able to do now what's called a meta-analysis. So the results I was sharing are using lots of different studies, lots of different life cycle assessment studies, um, and looking at an average of those overall. So it's pulling together um, a lot of different studies across the literature. Super. Andrew, you had a really good question. Do you want to pose it? Sure. Hi. Thanks, Allison. Also, really uh, love the SIMAP, SIMAP uh, program. I tried to implement it at a former school I worked at and really enjoyed learning more about um, that tool. Um, so I just really appreciate this presentation on the, uh, the impacts to greenhouse gas emissions from agriculture and, and the opportunities to mitigate that. I'm just This might be outside the scope of your work, but I'm curious if any of those 
agricultural products are more or less resilient to changing climate, making them um, you know, better or worse investments for future, um, future growing for farmers from the adaptation side of things? That's a great question. Um, does get a bit out of my area of expertise. Um, I think the one thing I, I can say is that um, we wanna make sure that we've got um, diversity in the types of foods that we're growing. So we wanna make sure that we're growing a, a range of um, a range of crops, not just a single crop and also not just a single um, type of crop or species of crop. So um, corn, for example, we wanna make sure that we're not all, not don't have fields and fields of the exact same um, genetic variety of corn, because then that's going to be very susceptible um, to if there's a pest that can affect some of that, it could affect all of it, right? So having genetic diversity within crop types and then diversity across crop types is going to improve our resilience. But in terms of what specific crops um, might be more resilient and what, what we should choose um, to cite, I don't know the answer to that one. Well, I do think this brings up the interesting, like the, the community regional food system resilience aspect. Um, I mean, during COVID, everybody, um, food shelves tended to be empty, maybe not in the co-op food stores, but that, you know, it was hard to get food. So people went to their local farmer because we had the food and that's where our strength and resilience came from. So I do think that um, even aside from crop, that's like one of the local food system stories that we need to keep remembering is that, you know, regional resilience in the face of climate disruptions that are ahead, um, we need a strong food system, which is, um, you know, it's, it's, it is crop, but the, the bigger question is the food system, res the resilience part in the food system. So I think that was a great question. Yeah, I fully agree with that. Um, and I think that became very apparent in our, um, with the, the supply chain issues and food, um, foodish challenges that we had uh, during COVID that we need a, a diversity in types of food providers as well. Um, so that maybe there is still a role for the big farms because we have this big growing global population, but I, I think it just underscored the how essential um, our regional farmers are and that we need a range of farm sizes, farm types um, all over the country for a resilient system. So diversity in the types of crops um, and also diversity in our, our farms. Right, and I think this kind of circles back and Nicole, I see your hand raised that, you know, this circles back to sort of the, the topic and the cafes are talking about how we can tell the story about our local food system and support a more resilient food system. And I think that's one of the big takeaways is though, even though food miles technically might like are not the reason to have a, you know, to support a local, might not be the only reason to support a local farm. There are many, many others that are as critically important. Um, Nicole. You're, you're, you're leading right into what I wanted to say, which is that I, I just wanted to underscore that as we transition to this part of the conversation, I think it's important to distinguish between the carbon footprint of our food choices and so the greenhouse gas emissions associated with our food choices where local may not be smaller, um, and in some cases be larger footprints, but there's a climate resilient aspect. There's building a strong local and regional food system and that contributing to climate resilience. And those are two, it's a nuanced difference between those two ways of communicating about it as a network. Um, and that's part of the reason we wanted to host this, this cafe today. So I'm glad we're getting to it, that's all. Yeah. Um, there are a couple other questions in the chat. Uh, the approximate carbon sequestration capacity comparison between forests and pastures. Allie, is that your field maybe? Um, it's also outside of my area of expertise, but I will say that there is great potential for carbon sequestration in our, um, uh, in pasture land, um, that there's been a lot of great studies looking at things like applying compost in ways that we can build up soil organic matter to increase um, carbon sequestration in our pasture lands. Um, but I don't know the comparison very well across the, the potential. Or maybe there's someone else here that does actually. Um, are there questions I missed? Anybody else have, because we do have a, a question um, that we thought could 
bring for discussion. It's in the agenda. Um, like what messages, because we don't, we only have about six minutes left. What messages can we confidently and accurately communicate related to local food systems and climate friendly diet, which I feel Nicole maybe just gave a little preview. Um, any, Alan. Alan, are you there? Yeah, I'm here. I'm, I'm sorry, I missed your question. I was looking at the chat. Oh. But your hands raised. Is it not meant to be uh, raised? I, th I think maybe I scratched my head and now oh. the, the computer thing recognizes it and thinks I'm, I'll go back to mute. Oh, okay. Um, I mean, I think that, well, I mean, I think Nicole kind of said it, it's the, it, you know, the resilience piece. I think that is the story. It's also the economic resilience piece. So yeah, we need a strong food system, but also the food system is a really strong economic driver. Are you now raising your hand, Alan? Yeah, actually, <laughs> my colleague uh, Rebecca White is on, and for whatever reason, it also shows my name. So I think Rebecca has oh, Rebecca. my okay. hand raised. Thanks, Rebecca. <laughs> Hi, Nancy. Can you hear me? Yes. Oh, great. Hi. Um, this is a great conversation. So thank you for setting this up. It's very, it's interesting and informative. And I think that um, you're right, kind of the territory that we're getting into now is like, what is the value of having a local kind of more transparent food system? And I think a lot of um, the value that that provides is um, we become a body of voices rather than a one consumer at a store who feels like they don't have a voice in the way that their food is produced or they don't have an understanding of the way that it's produced even so so much of the the community relationships that you know we have in our local food systems provide resiliency in terms of um, food security but it also um, it ensures that we're we're moving as a body and we are setting um, you know, the expectations and the goals for, for ourselves and for the way that our food is produced. And um, yeah, I, I think that uh, what I see from a retail perspective is that um, a, lot, a lot of decisions um, that farms are, are able to make comes from, you know, consumers pushing for that. So um, yeah, it, it's a mutually beneficial, you know, give and take of like, well, well, now we need you to be a sustainable beef farmer, and uh, how do we support you in doing that? Um, yeah. Great. Um, there are now several more questions in the chat. Um, maybe an answer: comparison of carbon sequestration between forests and grasslands depend heavily on local conditions, like type of forest, soil, and type. So maybe there isn't just one straight up answer for that question, whoever asked that one. Um, any, uh, Jacob. And I would say this will be the last question last just so question. that we can be respectful and close on time. Yes, which I think is a good one, Jacob, if you wanna share that. Yeah, I can say it with my human voice. Um, to, to all, all presenters today, thank you very much. And I'm just, I'm curious as we part today, if you have any tips or just resources or other organizations you can point to that are examples about how to communicate about this well with different audiences, recognizing that most people don't have an hour to sit and listen. So thank you. So I would really suggest the um, the Eat Lancet Commission and their um, brief for consumers. They have a list of bullet points that just summarizes their key takeaways, the things that they think people should know about um, food and the environment, and then the choices that we can make um, to reduce our, our food footprints. And so it's a, it's a really nice, clear summary and that they've got that brief for consumers and they've also got um, an equivalent for policymakers, for um, for farmers, for food preparers, a, a whole range of these briefs for different audiences. So that, I think that one would be a great resource. And for individual consumers, also just encouraging them to calculate their own footprint um, with an online footprint tool so they can get a better understanding of um, where they are now. I'm assuming maybe we're wrapping up. Nicole or Colleen, do you want to do the 
Yes, I, I feel like we could do this all day and I would love to, but I think we also get back to our all the other important work that we do. Um, I did put in the chat an evaluation that you I hope you'll take and tell us how how this was for you, this experience, this time together. Thank you again to Allie and to Nancy for shepherding us through this again complex topic. And it's a really great uh, uh, precursor to our next cafe, which is about reducing and repurposing food waste. So we'll have details followed up. Um, with that. And yeah, with that, please go forth onto your day. Thank you again. Um, and I hope that we can hopefully answer some questions uh, that were in the chat that we didn't get to, but um, this topic will be continued to, to evolve and grow as, as we continue on. So thank you all and have a great weekend. Yeah.